Hi everyone. Uh, hopefully you can can all see see my screen and and, and hear hear everything okay. Um, thank you for joining us for the next in our webinar series. Um, today we've got Ashley from um, California State University Northridge. Um, he's the director of athletic performance there, um, and and I'm sure Ashley will tell us a little bit about about the university. But it's um, Division One University, um, competing in many sports uh, and Ashley kind of oversees the, the, the whole program there and, and, and the coaches as well. Um, Ashley's going to be covering really great topic today for, for S&C coaches, which is in-season strength training, um, something which there's you know, often a lot of debate about as we get into competitive season and, and coaches tend to shy away a little bit from, from strength training, but Ashley's going to give us a good good in-depth discussion on why it's important and, and how to do it and everything else. So um, I'll hand straight over to Ashley and let him let him go ahead. So thanks for joining us, Ashley. You're welcome. Thank you very much for having me here, Andrew. Uh, yeah, then again, I'm from California State University in Northridge. We'll talk about resistance training. Let me go ahead here and uh, share my screen. Hope everybody can see that fine. So, so again, my topic is going to be specifically on resistance training in season. Now, obviously, there's many aspects in competition regarding physical and mental health, but I want to emphasize resistance training because ju just as Andrew touched on is there's, you know, different philosophies are behind it. There's a stigma, it seems, with many coaches and um, new coaches also have problems prescribing in season. So with this, I'll share kind of the system and methods which I operate with, and ultimately, the whole foundation is built upon science, just the methods that I vary based on context. Okay, first of all, I kind of want to talk about these real life concerns that I've heard and received from coaches, athletes in college, and even in the, the private setting, right? So they don't prioritize their life. It's not within their priority for whatever reason they, they believe. Right? They, they think it's an added liability, right? whether it's a, a risk, people might get hurt. That's kind of the belief behind that. Oh, it's one of my favorite ones. They don't want them to be slow and bulky. Oh, here's my other favorite. They don't want their athletes to be sore. You do not want their athletes to be sore. I, I'm pretty sure most of you have heard that, or these yourself and maybe even others. But my response to that is always, I have a conversation with them. I, I provide the scientific rationale and my approach is how I can mitigate and prevent some of these concerns. And I just drink my tea and just, we still lift in season. Okay, so here's some uh, background on why I believe we should lift in season, right? We, we're gonna reduce the effects of detraining. And same reason to lift at any period of time, whether it's strength, power, mobility, Whatever reason you'll lift in the off season, it'll be the same reason we'll lift in this in the in season. I right, potentially improve durability and or excuse me, retain durability and resiliency. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more on this with with some some research as we go along, right? And uh, maintenance, I put question mark there because I've had some teams. We if we have room to grow based on our schedule, then then we go if. But then again, based on the schedule, if we have to back off, then we back off. Right? And um, again, lift in season, I believe the circle of life. We, we just got to lift. We just got to train all year round. So this is my, my take on what makes a good in-season program. What a good starting foundation that makes a good in-season program is a great off-season program. If you periodize and appropriately apply the scientific foundation to developing the physical attributes that you believe are important in the off season, that's going to set you up for success throughout the season in which you plan to train in, right? So in, in the off season, there's typically a convenient schedule, which uh, less competitions, you can maximize technical proficiency, time under the load, work capacity, mental stress or tolerance. So that, that sets you the stage for your in-season training. So here, I just kind of want to show you the schedule which, which I operate in. Uh, most of our teams, we have 16 teams, majority of them will either be in the fall or spring sport. And most summers, 
we don't have very many athletes here um, except for men's and women's basketball uh, come in summer, they arrive. Then men's and women's soccer, they arrive late, late in the summer. So matter of fact, they're here right now. In two weeks, they will begin their, their season competitions. Right. And in the winter, we typically have two to four weeks off. So that's that's kind of like a break that they get from being on campus. Okay, so here's some of the literature, at least in, in terms of detraining. And this one is from McMaster. And this is six weeks of rug, rugby players. Um, they basically didn't train. They were just doing a light aerobic exercise for about six weeks. But um, you can see, right, in terms of strength, significant in terms of p-value, not, not very significant. Effect size is small and moderate, but you can see an observed difference after six weeks. You can see an observed difference, uh, 165, 154, 130, 28. And we move over to the 10, 20, 30 meter sprint. So look at speed. There is a significant differences after six weeks along with pretty large effect sizes. Right, whether those times are, are valuable to you, those split seconds, I mean, you, you, would, you would decide that, whether that 1% is something you would take. Again, this is, a, this is now a counter movement bench throw is what, these, what they did for these metrics. And again, no significant differences, but you can see some effect size, have some small effect sizes. Okay, my, give me a second. My computer just froze. Okay, there it is. All right, so here, this next study, these are 18 year olds. Uh, they they detrained for about four weeks. They're from Brazil. And um, what you can see here, what's interesting is they're kind of moving jump after four weeks. Mind you, this is between competition, between two significant competitions and uh, approximately 26 days. Some of their kind of moving jump actually improved. Right, so it kind of goes against some beliefs, but four weeks, 26 days, 18 years old, um, time when we jump improved. Okay, you have to excuse me, my, my um, PowerPoint is not, is freezing up. Excuse me, one minute here, guys, it's freezing up, it's loading. Okay, so give me one second. Let me try to fix this. Okay. All right, so here, excuse me again. Now, velocity, 10 meter sprint, not very much uh, difference. And again, same thing with the leg press strength. 26 days, no significant differences there. Now, here, this is four week detraining versus tapering. And these were bass players, they're about 24 years old. So. If you look at the, the black solid line, that's kind of pre-assessment. The black solid line is pre-assessment. And here, these dots here, that's after 16 weeks of resistance training. And it was appropriate periodization for, for everybody. They moved towards strength and power. And they either tapered for four weeks or they detrain. And you can see here, this is half squat. Uh, I mean, in the literature, they are in their article, it says, it's a very full squat, but it says half squat, so whatever. And you could already see the significant difference between time point. Okay, so that's that's half squat, half squat, 60% power. So in the taper group, we see improved a little bit. You can see an observed improvement, it's actually significant improvement as well. And in the D training group, same same idea, counter moving jump. Not much observed difference there, but significantly different. Bench press as well, same idea. And, and this is just kind of like the reference that I use. It's by, by Anthony Turner. It's kind of based on, they, they put there in the force time curve where the emphasis on the sport or where you kind of be, where they're kind of working at or what's the priority for them. And right here to the left, that's just what type of athlete do we have? It, it's not necessarily is one better than the other. It one's, higher rate of force development, one is not, but with greater strength. So here, this is my schedule here at California State University, Northridge. I took this from our website. Uh, it's not super specific. I didn't count the specific days, but roughly 13 weeks, 16 weeks, 17. And you can see for yourself, this is about our timeline throughout the season. 
Now here's some some kind of literature in injury. Here's a here's a good um, another article that I really like by Tim Suckamel. They, they talk about the significance of strength training and athletic performance and kind of how it underpins a lot of at least power um, hypertrophy. That's very correlated to all other aspects of physical attributes. All right, but but um, ultimately what what they touch on injury and how stronger athletes may be less likely to get injured. Again, it's not a direct impact, like you resistance train and no injuries are gonna occur. I mean, there's, there's just a correlation there that the stronger you are, there's a chance that you might not get injured. Here's another article. Is, these are 13 and 14 years old and they resistance trained for about 12 weeks. You know, the exercises weren't very specific, but they, it was, according to them, it was appropriately periodized and progress towards power and ballistic training. What's, what's interesting here is they, they also train in season. And again, if you look at the total injuries at the bottom, you, we, have, we have four totals in the training group and we have 13 in the control group. Now, I, I like to look at the muscle strains there, which is interesting to me, six versus zero in the control. And uh, I mean, again, it's not a direct math, but th these are interesting correlations. Weak things break. This is a, um, whatever your philosophy is, this is a cool quote that I thought I'd put up there for, for everybody to enjoy. Um, and again, let, let me go back to this injury. Um, I don't know if anybody's familiar with Tim Hewitt, but we spoke with him as well. He's a specialist in ACL. And um, although strength is a huge factor in, in injury, according to him, it's not, it's not the end all be all, obviously, as most of us know, but it does play a 20% role in minimizing the risk of an ACL tear, and this is as per Tim Hewitt again, but now here you go, back to our commercial break. Okay, now, so repeated bout effect and um, causes a, an eccentric muscle contraction. So repeated bout effect, in, in short, is basically a defense mechanism in which you, you train and then so the next time you train, your body's built some kind of mechanism to help prevent it from muscle, muscle damage. So what's associated with a repeated bout effect is just after a single bout of resistance training, there's already an increased reduction in DOMS in the, in the following bout, right? Obviously with progressive overload and added load and addition to new or unaccustomed, unaccustomed exercises, you can still induce DOMS, but however, you, you can reduce those effects if you simply train. All right, another interesting fact for here for, for injured athletes, there's a crossover effect. So if, you work the contralateral side, the injured side may gain some benefits for the repeated bout effect. So for, for return of play, you may get a little bit of ahead of the game on that injured side. Okay, this study, this is two seconds, four seconds, and six seconds each centric after four weeks. You can see the dotted line are pre-assessments and the hard black line are post-assessments, uh, RPE based on how, how sore they were or excuse me, perception of how sore, sore they were. And they did four sets of six repetition between 80 and 85% one rem. And, and you can see in just over four, four weeks, there's already a reduction in their perceived, perceived soreness, All right? So, so what does this mean to me at least? It means we're, we're gonna train and you know, I'm unsure of the effects of the loss of, at least extrapolating with the loss of repeated bout effect or detraining, or even whether it truly does directly impact injury, but we're, we're gonna train and we're gonna train appropriately to minimize those risks. And I'll, I'll go over kind of how I program to kind of adjust those concerns. Okay, ultimately in, ter in terms of planning, we always get a bird's eye view, look at a, the overall picture, right? Just, just like everybody else, simple programming, just like what you would do in the off season, except now we have different time points, competition, is there mandatory off days or, or what have you? We'll reassess the goals depending on the length of the season and what we achieve in the off season. Do we have time points where we can train through it? Are there preseason matches where it's a convenient schedule and we can be a little bit aggressive and kind of peak at a different point in time? I will plot the games and special dates in a calendar. Everything is written out in a calendar. I, I put it from the entire 18, 16 weeks, however long it is. I'll mark the games, the lift days, and I'll be ahead of the time. And then from, from our peak point or our last competition, we'll just reverse engineer. 
I right, work where what what time points I want my load to be. Do I want 80% here, 90%, 3 RM, 1 RM, whatever. Right? Or we'll create a whole outline of the entire program. Right? Most importantly, everything I write is in pencil. Everything I write is in, in pencil. It's very, uh, you stay very flex flexible, but I have my outline. I know where to go. If things go wrong, we make my adjustment. Okay, again, this, this is our schedule. All right, so this is what I mean by uh, plotting everything. At least this is for women's tennis here. And this was in February, 2020. It's what I call a convenient schedule. If you take a look, you have one game per week about the end of the week and majority of them are home games. I write it down, we're gonna lift Monday, we're gonna lift Wednesday and so forth and so forth. Here's their off days. This is what I call a convenient schedule. And this type of schedule, we could be pretty aggressive here. Uh, at least I would be pretty aggressive, right? So we could go We could go Monday, it can be our hard days. Tuesdays can be our moderate, moderate days or depending on what we wanna achieve here. Here's more of a, I call, definitely a schedule we don't want for lifting. Majority of these games are away. So they have to travel. They have to travel, they have to travel. We have two mid games. This is three within the week itself. And here's one. And again, I still plot the lift days wherever we're going to lift every chance we get. Now, this is very important that you communicate with the coaches because you need it to be as accurate as possible, right? So you always have to follow up or at least I always follow up every week, couple of weeks, any changes, what's going on. Here's the plan. This is still what we're intending to do. Hey, this, uh, we have baseball here. If you don't know, uh, we have starting pitchers here in the bottom. We have each day there's a different pitch, uh, pitcher and I kind of have a general sequence of what they would do. So if, if they start, if they're going to pitch on Friday, the day before with lifting will be pretty much off, right? The following day, They'll dynamic, they'll do light conditioning, they'll lift lower body, and then Sunday they'll lift upper body. And I let the student athletes choose in season what they prefer here in terms of upper or lower body. Majority, majority of pitchers will probably choose, choose lower body. And then another midweek big heavy lift for them after an off day, that's kind of paired with their bullpen or the, day, the same day that they throw. So we keep the high intensity stuff together as much as possible. And the following day, these say plyos and sprints, but these aren't very high intense, they're kind of more conditioning, moderate, let's just not intense in terms of super maximal effort, but good effort, repeated contacts and, um, but still long rest. Now, let me go, let me go back to that. If you come up here, this is, we'll have a game day, as you can see, depending on your schedule, we'll have a game day. Typically there'll be a game on Tuesday as well. And that's where the communication comes into play. And that's where you take a look at who are the high volume players, who are the low volume players, who can be a little bit more aggressive? Who can be, who's got to pull back? Or do we completely back off and take an off from weights? But yes, we will have game day lifts. All right, so kind of how do I apply the programming? Ultimately, everything is kept simple. Basics, bands and Vertimax and force plates or whatever. Right? There's minimal to no variation in exercise selection. Minimal to no variation in exercise selection. For the most, for the most part, the exercise itself doesn't choose what physiological attributes you're gonna improve, right? It, the load is the bigger issue, the load and the velocity of the movement. Let's, let's take a squat, for example. We take a squat and we, we work 85 to 90%. You're, you're gonna be able to perform that. You won't be able to do that with 10 reps if that's your true 85, 95 percent. That means we're kind of emphasizing strength, strength work. Now let's, let's back off that load. Let, let's go a little bit lower and let's focus on the reps base. Let's focus on the reps. Now let's, let's induce a little bit of metabolic stress, eight to 12 repetitions. Now it's not that we're focusing on strength, but there's an emphasis on hypertrophy based on the addition of uh, metabolic stress and potentially time under tension. All right now let's go even further back. Now let's go 10 to 20 percent of your max. And let's speed up the velocity with the same intent as you would have in a squat and let's not decelerate the top. And it's basically still a squat, except we're, we're now have time in the air. It's, it's a jump, right? We're coming down. So that's kind of my, my philosophy with um, exercise selection throughout the season. There, there's not much changes, right? Low velocity intent or durations as I, as, I, as I explained. 
And again, the most specific sport, specific actions we do in season are the practice and competition, right? The specific biomechanical emphasis are from practice and the sport itself. Now, again, there's low volume players or guys who are not practicing much, low minutes. We'll, we'll adjust their program a little bit because my program is written in pencil, right? There's a, there's a general outline for everybody, but we write in pencil for individuals based on their needs. Here's just some of the variation I'll, I'll probably move towards within the season. Um, depending on the team, we'll, um, especially if we have our, our sprinters, we'll focus on one leg and we'll maybe move towards partial squats. High, spool, high pulls, maybe not catching as much, but we, we still will pull, but not saying we don't do the others, but these are probably the main changes that we'll do. Anti-rotations, most specifically for, for my golfers, my tennis, my rotation sports, where off season, we're, we're rotating a lot. We're going heavy, we're, we're adding that. But in season, if we have high volume games, they, they are rotating a lot. They're rotating a lot. Maybe we'll touch a little bit, but for the most part, if, if they're getting that from the sport, we, we back off and we, we add more of anti-rotation emphasis. Again, strength and power is pretty much my emphasis throughout the season. If that's kind of what we ended with in the off season, because that was our ultimate goal, in addition to everything else, of course, motor control, good technique, mobility, full range of motion, but ultimately we want speed, speed kills, right? So if that's what we emphasize, that's what, that's what we'll still train within the season. Re volume will typically be reduced via repetitions. If I need to increase volume, most, most of the time it will be through sets, right? If it's a day one in a convenient schedule, I'll probably increase sets and maybe add a repetition in uh, for our volume, right? So here, high minute players stay, stay low, bench players can grow. If you, if you ain't playing much and you ain't getting much physical or mental stress on you, we're growing. All right, with a convenient schedule, again, day one, we'll, we'll probably use this. This is a typical off-season scheme that I use here in the left, OS. But uh, that's not to say we could go above or below it off-season, but that's typically what, what we'd work with. And in season, we just kind of reduce, we reduce the repetitions. The dash here is, so I'll probably give them ranges. How, how do you feel? All right, if you, if you want to go, you can go. If not, okay, it's not, not a problem. Let's just touch, let's just touch. On, on that intensity, right? Henneman size principle. Let's recruit what we've been recruiting in the off season. All right, surf the curve, right? Let's, so we'll surf the open ends. We'll surf the open ends. If they're, if they're jumping a lot, they're sprinting a lot, they're, they're getting the high speed, low force in practice and sport, we'll, we'll fill in what we're not, right? So we'll have a strength and strength speed emphasis. There's a good resource here by Anthony Turner. They, um, good resource. Um, they, they talk about everything from practical applications and underpinnings of, of power. There's another resource I like if you, if you like cleans and clean derivatives. This is by Tim Suckamel. I, I really like this. I know I talk about not varying exercises, but um, you can get the idea like of a jump shot. You know the idea behind it. So we'll, if we stay high pools, we'll probably manipulate the load and get and work around this idea. Right, we assess, I assess in season, preseason, midseason. Again, whether it's going to take part or the whole session, we will assess. And this, this philosophy here now is added because now, based on return to play protocols, if, if you read, if you go through the scientific literature, there's a general consensus that you just got to bring them back, simply put, to where they were. And if we don't have metrics of where they were or where, even where they're at, how, how do we go back? Right, and we're a two to four year program. I know we've, we've heard that that's gonna take the entire session, that's a waste, but this, we don't have a six week magic get you fit for sport. We are, this is a two to four year resistance training athletic performance program. That one session is not gonna neg negatively impact our program. As a matter of fact, if we look at it from, from baseline and uh, return to play and overall improvements, now we have metrics to see if what we're doing is actually working of reading to make adjustments. And sometimes it is built into the session itself. Now it's further explained right here, All right? So this, this assessment of strength here is built into the program. This assessment is built into the program of where, where I mean, you choose an exercise. Are we at high pool? Are we at a back squat? Are we at a bench press? Are we at a deadlift? 
uh, trap bar deadlift, whatever you want. That's that is built into the program. By the time we get to 90%, I'm also assessing technical failure, movement competencies. Are, is the technique still as good as what I consider? Is it within my parameters of good, right? If it's at 90%, I make these determinants at the bottom. Okay, and part of that is how does the athlete feel? RIR question mark. How many you think you could have done, right? If the athlete looks good, feels good, wants to go, let's go. We can go. Now, with that said, at, at depending on who it is, again, I could just say, I could even cut it off at 80%. I say, no, we're good right there. That's good. Why don't you just give me another single at that set or, or w whatever the case, right? Because again, writ written in pencil, but I have my outline. So I just max. If, if, if everything felt easy, they said my 90%, I probably could have done five to six more coach. And maybe my sixth one would have been painful, but I could have done it. I would probably adjust their, their training max. Right? Everything's 100% technical failure. We're not grinding it out to the point where we're lumbar flexion or we're just in pain. That's not, that's not the goal. I will cut lifts if it does not meet the technical demands that we ask of them. All right, again, here, it's all just their max. The observed max and training max is not the same. If Again, based on these parameters, if I ask them to look good, feel good, and to me, it looked good, I'll, I'll add five to 10% or whatever I think is appropriate at that time. Or vice versa, I'll back off. I'll also back off. I'll say, hey, um, instead of working doubles at 90, we do singles, or let's, let's work off of your 90% as your max for this next cycle. Uh, so this now is pretty recent. We, we have 10 iPads now and 10 uh, push bands. So now we're gonna kind of add it within our program and we'll kind of see correlations in season. I'm very excited to add that in. Hey, how many could have been done? Again, that's our question, bad timing. There is part of our assessments here. That's weekly monitoring. These are kind of moving jumps off of the jump mats. All right, so this was just taken last, this, this previous season from the baseball team. This specific athlete was uh, very interesting to me because he always said, oh, my knees hurt, my, my feet are hurting. And come to find out this empty point is this, this specific athlete needed orthotics or um, at, at least at the bare minimum needed orthotics. And eventually it improved. He improved relative to the team, right? As we go along the season, you can see, I mean, there's some dip points right there. He improved. Uh, additionally, if there's major dips within the team, I kind of take a look, reassess the overall picture. What have they done? Where, what's, what's my load like in the weight room? What's their load like in practice? I'll talk to the coach. How's everything like? This is what we got right here. I, I think I'm going to back off a little bit. What's your opinion? What are you guys doing in practice? You know, I, I'll get the overall picture of what's going on. If we got to back off, we back off. Here, this is something new we're adding. We typically just do a preseason using our force plates. We'll do kind of move and jump, but not again, if you see right here, it's not just gonna be for performance. We, we found bigger value for return to play protocols with the force plates. And part of that is returning them to where they were, where they were in addition to where are you at this time point of the season? How's your breaking rate of force development? Is your relative um, peak power still the same? How's your takeoff velocity? We look at all these things and we make our adjustments as necessary. See, here's, here's a case study of this athlete, which kind of helped reinforce why I need to be doing this more with these force plates. When this athlete came early on September, you can see peak landing force, asymmetrical differences with that um, ACL issues. He had ACL issues. He's about 12 months, but he didn't have great rehab because he hit COVID at the time. Right here, we did all the cues we need. We're training, rehab, and uh, it's hard to obviously get close to a balanced portion. There's obviously going to be an imbalance, but if you're 40, 45, 30% of an imbalance between left and right, that, that's a major problem. And, and you can see over time, it comes close to being more symmetrical. But now what's, what's un unfortunate here was this, this athlete began feeling some pain on the contralateral foot because I believe he, he practiced a little too much or, or whatever the case, but now this is, I believe it's gonna be important for us. And it's kind of how I, I, I kind of write the program. If you look up top, I, I have what, 
what we're doing, who we're competing against that week, right? So if you look in the left bench and back squat, that's kind of a built-in assessment. That's the built-in assessment right there. So that's in training and that's kind of what we do. And you can see for this, for this program here, this team, we flip-flop what was the emphasis on day one, whether it was strength or power, right? And then obviously here's, here's, here's our accessory. We go one arm, repetitions roughly about the same once we've come down the season. It's two arms now, so ultimately it's greater load. And if you can see in this specific program, this is a long cycle, eight, eight weeks. This is about seven to eight weeks, but what's my variation? My variation is the load. Okay, same idea here. This is, this is women's tennis. Same idea, but look at that aggressive schedule. I, I forget, this is 2020. That is such an aggressive schedule, which I, the one I showed you, they have a very, they had a convenient schedule the following year. This is COVID. Uh, no, excuse me, right, right, right before COVID. Very aggressive schedule. So some days I'll say off, I'll adjust, and we kind of taper off a little bit here, keeping the load. 85% for a double. I hear 80% for a single. Two sets for one, just increase the load. Increase the volume via the sets, singles at 80, right? Singles at 80, less sets. This is like a typical game day lift. This is for baseball. Is, these are accessory, or these are kind of warm up up here. I, I will typically give it 10 minutes before a lift, whatever you want to do. If you want a foam roll, stretch, whatever movement prep that you'd like to do, you, I give you that time. But once it's time, we're here, we're moving. Again, we're surfing the curve. This is, this is a little bit uh, low, low to moderate load. Their rest, their rest is their T-spine, but ultimately I'm not concerned with these supersets. I will tell an athlete, you sit there and wait. If it takes two minutes and you get bored, wait a little bit longer and then go again. Near deadlift, we'll, we we'll move a little bit heavier. This is actually, it says deadlift, but this was actually a move to a clean high pool eventually. As you see, we started working doubles and then singles eventually at the bottom. This is going towards the end of the season already. Right, so so conclusion, resistance training in season is necessary, I believe. Right, so plan accordingly. Right, write everything out, write it in pencil. Again, I, I added this, you don't need to change exercises for the sake of changing exercises. Don't fear the load, fear the volume. Right, write everything in pencil. Right, here, if y'all have some good research and literature um, that you like to send me please send it to me right there that's my that's my twitter handle as well if you want to argue with me on twitter you can do that and thank you for for having me so andrew let me know if we got any uh questions You have any particular advice for different coaches who cancel strength sessions? Yes, my opinion is that has to be done ahead of time at that bird's eye viewpoint. That's got to be established within the initial relationship with the coach. And um, obviously that's a very hard, hard, hard discussion at times, but you need to provide the scientific rationale. You need to provide your methods of how whatever concerns they have for not doing it, you need to be be able to answer those questions. And I think the scientific literature is, is pretty clear that resistance training is, is definitely has greater benefits than it does have um, with, with the negative effects. So establish the relationship early on. How do you deal with athletes who complain of soreness? That's a good, that's a good um, question. So just like my, my monitoring and my assessment, and I will take a look at what they've, what they've done load-wise the day before. And, and that is a discussion I'll have. A lot of the times I'll remove the eccentric portion. 
right? So, so our deadlifts and our high pulls, right? There's minimal to no eccentric portion. And I have a discussion with them. Listen to me. I, I say, sometimes you're, you're going to be sore. And I have, excuse me, before I get to that, before I get to discussion, I got to reflect. What did I do? Did, I, did we do anything? Did they just play so hard? Um, do I, did I establish a relationship with the athlete to know enough that this athlete is just the type that just can't mentally can't push through things as well as, as others maybe. But again, I'll have that discussion and I'll reinforce them. Like, this is part of the program. I, I want you to think, I say, I'll say things like, I want you to think if, are you hurt or, or injured or is this soreness really hurting you? And, and as we move up in progression, we'll start with the barbell. Let's go, let's go 60%, 50%. Now, if they're complaining just to complain, and I know I've checked the boxes that everything is where it's supposed to be. I will also say, listen, do the damn program. Excuse me, my French, right? Do, do the program. You're, you're fine. You're, you're just complaining to complain. But at other times, I'll adjust the program. That rep range, we could say, okay, instead of going up to 90%, let's back off. Let's do singles up to 80. And that's and, and we're good for the day. And the rest, just move around. I say, just move around. You don't have to push the load on the accessories. Just move around. But I think that individually, it, it, it takes a part of you knowing what they've done, what you have in the program, knowing the athlete, and what adjustments you're going to make and if it will fit your program, if it will fit your parameters, the principles of your program. I hope that answers your question. That's a really good question because we, we do get that often. There's one, at least one in every team. I think there's one, um, one question in the chat box as well, if you can see okay. that. What's the questions, what strategies do you use to create buy-in from coaches and athletes? I think that goes back to meeting the athletes, right? Uh, going back to meeting the coaches and meeting the athletes. Um, my goal is never to say, I want to create buy-in. I think you need to have a system that you, you employ and what you do and you need to believe with a scientific rationale and your clinical experience that what you do in your program will improve their training. And um, I don't think you can necessarily force that on people. I think you also have to love what you do and it has to show that you care about the student athletes, you care about the program, you care about improving every single person's physical abilities. And hopefully with your passion and loving what you do, that shows. Now, with that said, I have had coaches where right off the bat, they do, coach, I love what you do. And then have coaches who you, most of you have experienced, you'll argue, you'll get a back and forth with the coaches. I've had meetings with administrators and everybody, the whole works, the president, oh, we, this is not what we want to do, blah, 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 blah. And then two to three weeks later, you got the coach inviting you over for a barbecue and, and the student athletes are all fired up. And, you know, so I, I think you got to touch, aside from the program, you got to touch the relationship aspect because whether you're, you're a big dog or and you're a big name in the field, but you treat people in a way where you don't establish rapport with them, I don't think trust will in your program will be built in, but that's my opinion. That's a great answer, uh, Carlos Perez. Our question, I'm sorry. Uh, all right. Uh, is that all we got for questions? I think there's one more gone in the Q&A. Okay. Uh, I can't see one. I got one is just, okay. I get bored doing the same workout routine for long periods of time. How do you deal with this to keep them engaged? Um, yeah, that's true. I think what, what I want to first talk about is my philosophy and the program. I let them, again, this is early on. I let them know what we're doing. I, I, I let them understand what we're doing. And I personally have not had anybody yet say, I'm like, just this is just me personally. I've not had anybody yet say, 
uh, coach on board. Matter of fact, after like week four or five, we've become more um, efficient rather. Boom, what's the program? Let's do our, our barbell complex. Boom, boom, we're getting it. What's the intent? But I mean, that will be up to you. You you create the the variation. You know, I'm I'm a pretty loud guy and I can be a pretty loud guy. So I coach with juice. I, I see the whole whole platform from everything. I see your barbell warm up. I, I, I charge your intent. I touch five to ten seconds and everybody as I make my way around. So that's that is a kind of more maybe I guess how you approach it. You can change the exercises if you want, but ultimately it has to fall under the parameters of what you're trying to improve, develop, or create. But ultimately, then again, remember DOMS, remember DOMS, right? Unaccustomed, new, unaccustomed exercises, eccentric exercises will have a greater chance of inducing DOMS again. So, I mean, that you got to take that into consideration. You can vary if, if, if some variations I'll have, go two leg, one leg, um, one arm, two arm, whatever. If, if they want to trap bar deadlift, that's, but that's kind of more personally, how do you handle that? But I have not yet said, really had a complaint in the past three years I've been here at CISA. And I, I mean, yeah, I don't know. I think, I mean, if you're hitting 80% on a high pool and then 85% the other, I mean, if you're bored right there and complaining, I don't know, your focus isn't on the intent, and which, which I'll kind of catch energy as well. If I, if I have energy, I'll stop the entire room, bring them in, reestablish our focus, reestablish our goals. We're, we're not in the business of necessarily creating a playground. Of course, we want you to be happy, but we reestablish our goals in a division one setting, in a competitive atmosphere. Yeah, sometimes it kind of ignites the fire, which you, sometimes you get overall, overall boredom because we're tired, school stress, mental stress. We have 19 years old, first time away from family. But, and again, I would like to go back to that relationship and knowing your athletes and when, when to make some kind of adjustment. So in conclusion, make the adjustments you need, but it has to fall under the umbrella of what you're trying to develop. That, that's, a, that's a great question though. I've never, if you had issues and answers, email me, I'd like to kind of hear about it and know. I think that looks like you've got them all, Ashley. Okay, um, thank you. So so unless any more suddenly um, come through quickly, uh, I'll just uh, thank you for that. I was, you know, really informative. I think having that scientific background to it is is really useful and really important that you can show to the coaches and things like that. Um, so yeah, I found that I found that really helpful. And thanks for giving up your details so that people can contact you as well. I'm sure um, everyone really appreciates that. Yeah, for sure. Thank you for having me. Thank you. And th thanks everyone for joining us. Um, we'll, we'll be announcing some more webinars um, over the next few months. Um, and also we've got our conference at the end of the month. So hopefully a lot of you can join us there. Thanks again, Ashley. See you Take later. Care.